Hello, everybody, and welcome to the virtual chapter for June 2022. And what a wonderful day we are having. Uh, feels like, by the way, Karen, uh, 105 degrees here in Orlando today as well. It feels like 105 in Chicago, and that's not normal. <laughs> well, that's why it's so nice that you have that. Well, both of us, we have these beautiful bodies of water behind us. So that's we, right. uh, you know, anything to cool off, anything to cool off. <laughs> Exactly. So, uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, we've got an exciting show lined up for you tonight. Uh, I think before we get underway, we might have a couple of announcements that uh, would be uh, would be nice to take care of. Um, First, One thing for CEUs, for watching tonight, you get CEUs, and all you have to do is go to your friendly uh, association. Uh, IACT IMDHA, of course, will give you a couple of hours for joining us tonight, but all friendly organizations will also honor that and give you uh, continuing education requirements. Yeah. And if you don't know how to do it with IACT IMDHA, just log into the website and uh, your, your, actually your information will pop up and there's a place for you to literally fill in uh, that I spent an hour and a half, uh, you know, listening to Karen and Michael ramble in the background while Patricia Scott was trying to do something absolutely brilliant. And uh, I think I deserve to get compensated for that. And they will, you know, they will give you an hour and a half worth of credit. Um, anything else, Karen? I don't think so. Okay, so here's the announcements. Um, July, and, I, and if you've got something that comes in between, just uh, let me know and pop it in here. But the next thing I've got is July 9th and 10th um, is the uh, board certified hypnotherapy program that I act uh, that I act runs. It's an online program. It is. Uh, Two days long, all day Saturday and Sunday, and um, basically what we do is for those people that are interested in, uh, in getting the uh, getting uh, uh, what do I say designated as a board certified hypnotist, we uh, we sort of find out what it is they've got, but we make sure that they've got the cutting edge of some of the latest and newest and best stuff as well, and um, it's a delightful a delightful weekend. So. If you have an interest in that, uh, check it out. Uh, you have to go to the website, of course, for Actor IMDHA to get all the details and to register. So there is that. Now you can talk about the next one, Karen, which is- Okay. Uh -huh. Hypno Thoughts Live in Vegas, uh, the 20, uh, 29th, 30th, and 31st of July. And it is a huge conference. If you've never been to something this large, you must go to Hypno Thoughts at some point. I'll be teaching um, a wonderful process, the goal affirmation process. I really, really love it. It's a way of turning everything over to the client, making it very client-centered. And Michael, what will you be teaching it? Oh, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, well, and I'm going to be teaching something too. Uh, yes. And I and I don't remember exactly what it is, but uh, I'm sure it's going to be something fabulous. I'm sure there's going to be something fabulous. I'm so embarrassed. Once again, <laughs> twice in one in one phone call, we get embarrassment from Michael. Yeah, I, I, I tell you what, things have been running 100 miles an hour here post conference uh, because of, in fact, the very next thing that I'm going to tell you. Uh, Michael Watson had this interesting idea that in the month of June, that is this current month, by the way, uh, in case you know you're uh, you're listening later or or something, and uh, that that after the conference was over, that I would just sort of really kick back this month and do as little as possible, you know, some of my online clients and stuff, but no, no major productions, no, you know, uh, nothing, and. Uh, and Linda Otto, I'm telling on her now, uh, Linda Otto uh, understood that I was going to take the month off. And then she said to me via text a couple of days ago, about four days ago, she said, Michael, she said, have you been thinking about the galaxy of the stars yet? And I said, the galaxy of the stars? I, so I texted her back. I said, well, well, yes, <laughs> very simple. Yes. You know, every, and everything that that implied, uh, the tone wasn't quite there, but you know, yes. Uh, I thought since it's in September that, you know, I would take my time and towards the end of the month or gradually be beginning to put this together. And she said, because we're about to send out the, the unlimited human and we'd like to be able to put a, you know, to put a, a promo thing in there about it with all the details. <laughs> so uh, so uh, the, the, the Galaxy of the Stars on the 10th and 11th of September is truly an international event. Uh, we've got folks from uh, Spain, Belgium, Switzerland, and uh, uh, some other interesting country, South Africa, that's, that's what it is, uh, that are going to be presenting at it. The, the, the theme is hypnosis around the world. 
and uh, they've all got their unique presentations to do, of course, and, and uh, it'll, it'll be wonderful. But the point is, two days ago, we didn't have any presenters. <laughs> <laughs> and so literally nonstop for the last 48 hours or so, uh, and with people in a distant time zone as well, that just adds a lovely little wrinkle to, to all of those kind of things. We have got it together and it is going to be so exciting. Just to let you know what we've got going on, we've got um, uh, Barbara, Barbara Scholl, who is, uh, some of you may know uh, Hans-Rudy Weef. Who, uh, who runs the Omni uh, outfit in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, Barbara is his sister and she works with kids. She's written a great book called Hypno Kids and has a whole bunch of stuff about that. So she's gonna be talking to us about that. Uh, then we have uh, Claudia Klein from South Africa. And uh, 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 oh my gosh, uh, I, I, I apologize. I'm not quite getting her topic title and it's it's all too much in my in my mind but it's about really expanding what it is that you do with clients to be able to uh to take an even deeper dive uh something about going farther or uh, something like that I, I apologize for not knowing the exact words uh then we are going to have on the second day um nicole uh walker nagel some of you know nicole yep. she's uh, she's a great friend of ours and she's on here all the time and her title is the confident hypnotist i just love nicole because she has got so much joyous energy and enthusiasm uh, about what she does and i think something that we all could stand to get a dose of from time to time and then the last uh the last presenter is uh, Ed Jore, uh, and I bet a very few of you probably know him yet in this group, but he is a master trainer of, uh, of IACT and also a student of Melissa Tears. He lives in Spain. He is a former musician with a, a jazz background, and he is, I would just have to say, a true hypnotic shaman. And uh, what he's going to be talking about is flow in hypnosis. Uh, and this idea about being able to just enter into the hypnotic relationship and uh, and allow what needs and wants to happen to present itself as opposed to being you know rigid and scripted and that kind of stuff. And he's just really he's just really great for that. So we are going to have a wonderful time in September. But in the meantime, <laughs> we we are here at the virtual chapter tonight. And by the way, Karen, there is one thing that I didn't say to you yet. This uh oh. What is that? Good evening, Karen. <laughs> Good evening, Michael. Thank you very much. Man, we're so excited about tonight. We're just plowing right on in. I understand. <laughs> okay, so um, so in a few minutes, we're going to have our, our primary guest, uh, which is Patricia Scott. And in the time between now and then, I just wanted to share something with you. We, we tend to do a little... 15 minute, this is going to be interesting to do in 15 minutes, little 15 minute features uh, to just so you get more than one, more than one thing. Just think your grocery bag is even fuller than before. Uh, so so I wanted to talk to you about the Betty Erickson self-hypnosis technique and uh, and give you a couple details about it. Uh, I know Karen has presented it. I think, I thought maybe in this group, but I don't really know for sure. And oh my God, I have to interrupt myself, Karen, because as I said your name, the voice in the back of my head said, don't forget, I know that you don't know this. And I remember last asking you last year and it surprised you, but this meeting of the virtual chapter is your fifth anniversary of being a cohort. Uh, wow. And no, I never remember that. Thank you so much. And it's been so thrilling to, to be here and do this. Thank you, Michael. I owe you a lot. I'm very honored to still be uh, in this group. So have some cake. I will. <laughs> I actually brought a Snickers. So, well, just remember that it's on Flag Day. <laughs> yes, it is. It is on Flag Day and I dressed up for you guys. All right. Grant, we have in this country a flag day. And as you know, we have the Stars and Stripes. Sorry, I was talking across the pond for just one moment. I, I noticed, I looked at it, I thought, why are you wearing that? It must be a special day, I realized. So thanks for explaining that, Karen. You're well, welcome. You know, the is, they, they are the colors of the Union Jack, Grant. Yes. So, you know, uh, <laughs> so, you know, she's, she's, she's got something. That's, that's, that's what it was. We took an old Union Jack and refashioned it, actually, to make our flag in the first place. Oh, why waste our own fabric? That's right. 
We stole them all at the Boston Tea Party right off the boat. <coughs> okay, so Betty Erickson's self-hypnosis technique. Uh, this is based on something that Betty talked about. Betty Erickson is Milton Erickson's wife, if any of you are not aware of that, but something that Betty talked about. Uh, whenever people ask Milton Erickson about self-hypnosis, he said, oh, you should ask Betty about that. That's something she's very good about. And, and, then, and then Betty would explain her process which uh, kind of utilizes uh, some principles of mindfulness. There's a whole big backstory that I don't have time to tell you. So the shortest version is going to come about by me just opening up my uh, screen here for a moment and sharing a uh, image with you. This is a page out of the uh, uh, IAC student manual uh, describing the Betty Erickson self-hypnosis technique. And there's a couple of things that I want you to notice at the beginning. The graph on the left may make some sense to you as we get into it. But uh, first of all, you'll notice over here on the right-hand side, it says time, and it says purpose, and it says exit state, and then the process. This is the four steps of you know, how to do this. So the time is simply that, that when you're prepared to go into self-hypnosis, you make a statement to yourself about how long you're going to be in hypnosis for. I'd like to, I'm going to go into self-hypnosis for 20 minutes is the example given here. Uh, we use 20 minutes because the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi told us that if you wanted to change your life, 20 minutes twice a day was what would do it. So that seems like a good length of time. But whatever it is that, you're, that, you're, that your folks like uh, for however long, uh, you have a remarkable internal clock. And for those of you who aren't aware of it, if, if you know anybody who ever studied silver mind control, they will tell you all about it because it's a big, uh, it's a big thing in that. Uh, if you don't have a good clock, if you set yourself a timer, a mental timer for five minutes and you find out that you've, that you've overstayed, you know, or something like that, maybe you can train yourself with something like a kitchen timer or an egg timer. Uh, but at some point, you'll start to notice that you pop out of hypnosis right before the timer goes off, and then you will know that your internal clock has, in fact, been effectively calibrated, and you won't, uh, you won't need that egg timer anymore. So, uh, so you state how long you're going to go into self-hypnosis for. You state what your purpose is. And by the way, here's the deal. In self-hypnosis, we want to assign this purpose to the unconscious mind. Most of us have been taught something, I think, that is really problematic uh, and doesn't agree with the theories that, that at least so many of us hold about how hypnosis works. And that is that you go into hypnosis, you go into self-hypnosis, and then you start to give yourself suggestions. This is what I've heard people say before. But the deal is, if you when you start to give yourself suggestions and you remember what those suggestions are going to be, the problem is that you've reactivated all of the conscious mind stuff in order, in order to do that. So here's something I'd like you to realize if it hadn't occurred to you already. Your unconscious mind isn't going to wait until you're in hypnosis to start listening to you. It's already listening. It's already here. The issue in hypnosis isn't about bringing up the unconscious mind. It's about, it's about getting the conscious mind out of the way. But the unconscious mind is already there. So you can start giving those suggestions ahead of time. So in my opening statement, I will say, I'm going to self-hypnosis for 20 minutes for the purpose of allowing my unconscious mind to make the changes that are necessary and appropriate to assist me at becoming a better public speaker or whatever it is that I want. And just make it concisely like that and, and literally assign it to the unconscious mind. Then you won't worry about, do I got to do a bunch of stuff during this process? And let yourself know in that opening statement how you'd like to come out of trance. Typically, when somebody comes out of hypnosis and probably in your office, you know, they say, uh, you know, click your fingers and you say wide awake, alert and refreshed, you know, or something like that. Wide awake, alert and refreshed isn't all that it's cracked up to be. It's very nice at the appropriate time. And especially if somebody's going to leave your office and get in a car, you know, and drive off somewhere. But on the other hand, if you're doing self-hypnosis, for example, towards the end of the day at home, why would you want to be wide awake, alert and refreshed when you were finished? In fact, how about mellow and relaxed? Wouldn't that be nicer? Uh, as a matter of fact, you can bypass the purpose statement if you want to just use self-hypnosis for a state change by saying, I'm going into self-hypnosis for 20 minutes, and when I come out, I'd like to be sociable and gregarious, because maybe you have to go to some function where you need to interact with people, you know, and you, and you want to get an, an attitude pickup. But state the time, how long you're going in for, what your purpose is, and what it is, what state you would like to emerge in 
when you come back out of hypnosis. And then you begin the process. And this process is based on a very simple idea. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, I don't know what I was going to say, so that just slipped right out of my mind, but I'll, I'll, I'm sure that it will pop up again in a minute. Oh, I know. One of the things that, that, that we often think is that if you've got a client who is highly visual, you want to communicate with them in visual language. And I would say that that's an appropriate accommodation. It gets rapport. It helps you utilize the system of their conscious mind. However, hypnosis is an altered state of consciousness. And by implication, that suggests that it consists of using your consciousness in a way that is not your normal, usual, everyday way of processing your, your consciousness. And so hypnosis doesn't really occur in your primary representational system as much as it does outside of it. If you're somebody who has pictures in your head regularly, but rarely, uh, rarely has any sort of internal voices or sounds, and suddenly in the middle of a hypnotic event, you hear a great booming voice speaking to you, you would say, whoa, this is an altered state of consciousness. You know, similarly, uh, if you're somebody who rarely has pictures, you know, uh, and so you've, you know, the, the hypnotist also all kinds of uh, word stuff with you, but suddenly there is an image that is, it, it, it would be a profound thing, wouldn't it? And you would go, wow, I'm in an altered state of consciousness. So, so what we want to do ultimately is to get people out of their usual way of processing into one of the other ones. And Erickson often would walk people gradually where he would pace their primary system and then start to introduce one of the other systems, just a little bit at a time, and then a little more of that, and a little more of that, until he had moved them over from an experience of visualizing being on a beach to feeling the rush of air off the surface of the water and the texture of the sand and the warmth of the sun and, you know, and, and, and such as that, right? It's kind of an interesting thing. So now, if you're working with one person, you can start with their primary system and you can paste them over to some else. But if you're working with an audience, or if you want something that you can generalize that everybody can use, this technique is perfect because it allows you to spend one third of the time within your primary representational system, but two thirds of the time outside of it. And that one third is enough to continue to maintain rapport so you don't get too confused. And then those two thirds are enough to sort of carry you off into some other realms. So you'll notice in this chart on the left that there is a, a sort of hourglass shape with V's, A's, and K's, that is visual auditory and kinesthetic elements. Um, uh, in the top half of the graph, it says that they're external and in the bottom half, they are internal. What that means is I'm going to see, hear, and feel things uh, external to me in the external environment. Hypnosis involves spending less and less engagement with your external experience and then more and more increasing engagement with your internal experience. So we're going to do some things on the outside and then a little bit less and then a little bit less of that. And then we're going to do some things on the inside and a little more and a little more of that. And what we're going to do with these V's, A's and K's is very, very simple. You get comfortable, you make your statement. I'm not really really walk you into a trance, although some of you, you know, if you, if you go there, that's great. Just be sure and come back for Patty because I've got to do this real quickly. But, uh, but you get comfortable, you make your statement. I'm going into self-hypnosis for five minutes for the purpose of uh, allowing my unconscious mind to make the changes that will uh, assist me in integrating uh, this technique more fully. Uh, and when I come out, I'd like to feel uh, excited, enthusiastic, and ready to go on with the uh, virtual chapter. Then I look in front of me. And by the way, don't here's the, the one thing. If you have a resistant client when you're doing self-hypnosis, that's just stupid. <laughs> so please don't be stupid. It's, you're, you're the client. Your intention is to go in hypnosis. So give yourself permission to be successful with this. And just look out in front of you and find something that your eyes rest on, something small, like a spot of some kind, and just acknowledge what it is. So right now, as I sit here, I look in front of me and I see uh, a blue light on my video camera. That's the first V in this graph. It's external to me. And I'm just saying, I see this. I'm going to take another breath and just kind of settle in a little bit more and continue to look. And now I notice that I see... Uh, a key in a lock on the other side of the room. Another breath, just relaxing a little bit more and looking out in front of me. And now I see a, uh, a, a, 
I don't know what you call it. Oh, a rivet in a, in a binder uh, on the desk opposite me in the room. So those are three V's. Now I'm going to stop looking. I don't know if you can really tell it, but I'm just going to let myself defocus. I'm going to move all my attention to my ears and I'm going to listen. The first thing that I hear is the sound of my own voice talking to you. The second thing that I hear is an airplane off in a distance. And another thing that I hear is the sound of my own breath as I exhale. Now I'm gonna stop listening and I'm gonna to move to my kinesthetics and I feel my glasses resting on the bridge of my nose. It's good to do this a little more slowly than I am, by the way, because there really isn't a hurry. Uh, a ring on my finger. And the place where my back touches the back of the chair. Then I'm gonna see another thing. And another thing, notice it's two Vs now. So I'm gonna see two things and, and indicate what they are one at a time. And then I'm going to hear two things and I'm going to feel two things. Then I'm going to see something, hear something, feel something, and then close my eyes. And inside, I'm going to bring a picture to mind or to allow a picture, an image to come into my mind. And I see King Ludwig's castle in Bavaria. That's the one that I always see, by the way, it's rather interesting. You know, if you do this for a while, those first V's, A's and K's on the inside tend to be things that for me at least become a, a pathway, a portal, you know, into my place. So I see King Ludwig's castle, that's really groovy. I let it go and I allow a sound to come into my mind. Some people don't realize, but if you can bring a picture to mind, you can bring a sound to mind. And many of you, you, you know, your favorite song, you know, all sorts of things. The sound that comes into my mind is the sound of a mariachi band. And I hear it for a moment. I dig it, it's groovy for a moment. <laughs> and that's enough for me. And then I let that go. And if you can bring a picture to mind and you can bring a sound to mind, you can bring a feeling or a sensation to mind. And so I feel the warmth of the summer sun on my face and on my arms. And that's that K. Then you bring another image to mind, bring a second image to mind, bring another sound to mind and a second sound to mind, another feeling to mind and a second feeling to mind. And then gradually, as you see the chart, as we go farther down, three Vs, so that's three images, three sounds and three feelings. Somewhere for me in the middle of this bottom half of the graph, I don't get all the way, I never get all the way through it. Uh, I thought the first time that I did it that I had simply fallen asleep and I was disappointed. I said, damn it, I was going to do this for 20 minutes and I fell asleep. I really want to learn how to do this. So I tried it again and the same thing happened. And I thought, damn it, 20 minutes. I want to just do this. And then I looked at my watch and it was exactly 20 minutes, which was the time that I had prescribed. So I realized that for me, what happens is I'm going to lose consciousness somewhere around here. Some of you will, some of you won't. If you get all the way to the bottom, I would suggest, first of all, you might just go a little slower the next time. That's a choice. But also, if you get all the way to the bottom and you realize that there's still some sound left, well, there really is no end to this. You can do four of each. Allow another image and another image and another image. But just moving through in images, sounds, and feelings is really what it does. If you think about what you know about hypnotic theory, the conscious mind is completely occupied with this process of pictures and sounds and feelings. So it isn't interfering with the working of the suggestion, which you don't need to keep giving. You told your unconscious mind what you wanted it to do while you were out. And so trust that the, uh, the reference library, and I call her, inside of your head has gone back into the stacks. She's getting all of the uh, appropriate information together in order to, uh, uh, to produce an outcome for you. And just, uh, just let yourself trust and know that that is taking place. And if when you're in the internal section down here and you get halfway through it, somebody uh, pulls up in front of your house and slams the car door and you hear that, don't be distracted by it. Simply include it. Just say to yourself, now I hear the sound of a car door slamming. Acknowledge what it is, move on to the next thing. 
there's no right way, really. There's no wrong way to do this. But uh, I hope that you've found that uh, quick and quick and dirty demonstration, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, helpful. Uh, and if you have any questions about it, uh, I'll be happy to hear them from you. You can drop me a note, by the way, at flhypno at outlook.com uh, if we don't get a chance to get to it here, because I have taken my time. Uh, in fact, two minutes ago, I felt a crozier about my neck beginning to uh, pull me off stage. So, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I think it's time for us to, uh, uh, to open our, uh, our program to our special guest, uh, Ms. Patricia Scott. And I got to tell you, and, and uh, I, I see your mic coming off, Karen, so I know you're going to want to say something about Patty as well. Is that right? I just wanted to say, would you stop the share? Oh, why not? <laughs> what a good idea. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. So good to have a co-host. So, uh, gosh, it's got to be 23 or four or five years ago. Uh, that I was at a uh, convention in uh, Long Beach. No, 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 no. It's funny. I know the name of the place. Oh, Newport Beach. Newport Beach, California, uh, of the American Board of Hypnotherapy. Scott Sandlin was there. He was a child at the time. Uh, not so different than today. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and I wandered into the uh, into the bar. I recall one uh, uh, afternoon, early evening, and this uh, uh, this young lady with uh, teased out blonde hair. Th this is my memory, and I know Patty, you, you don't always agree with this memory, but but I swear to God, there was a woman sitting at the bar that looked like Stevie Nicks, and I thought this is my chance. So, so, uh, so I sat down next to her and we began a friendship that has carried us through all of these years. Uh, she, uh, she had a, a, a show business career uh, before she got into the world of hypnotherapy. And uh, we might get her to say a little bit about that when we get started. And uh, she has just been a great contributor. She runs a school uh, here in Florida on the, uh, on the Tampa coast in, uh, in Palm Harbor. Uh, and uh, has uh, has been been doing that for the 20 or so years that she's been in Florida now. And uh, we're just delighted to have her here. She's going to be sharing with us about the pivotal response conditioning, which is a, a process that she developed. And she has recently presented at the IACT IMDHA conference as well. So, hey there, Patricia, how are you doing? I'm good. You can call me Patty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. I'm just reading it because it's on my screen. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, well, we're really, we're really happy to have you here. And and so yeah, so you came to us from show business. How I, I'm curious, I, I, I if you if you don't mind me taking this for a minute, how do you how would you say that having had a background in theater uh, influenced or affects the way that you work in hypnosis? I think it's exactly the same thing, actually, is my honest answer. <laughs> I was doing hypnosis before I knew I was doing hypnosis. And I'll bet, uh, by the way, thank you so much for asking me here tonight. Uh, but besides being uh, United in the United States Flag Day and Karen's fifth anniversary of this, of this uh, virtual chapter and all these other things we talked about, I love all those cats I'm seeing on the screens here. Uh, it's also a full moon tonight, so if you all walk outside when we're finished here, depending on what time it is where you are, of course, uh, there is a full moon, supposedly, officially tonight. I've been watching it for a couple of nights, so yeah. Yeah, the show business is, is what I dreamt of as a kid. I was hypnotizing myself from the age of whatever age it was that I discovered I had a mind and could think. So probably around age three, four, five, somewhere in there when you start getting ideas in your head. And I got it in my head right away that I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to be a performer. And I started hypnotizing myself. This isn't usually part of this uh, process, but, you know, we all come from backgrounds that we have things unique to what we learned from whatever we did before we became hypnotists. And I'm, a, I'm guessing that most of the people, if not all of them on this uh, are hypnotists. But even if you aren't, whatever you're doing right now in your life, everything influences you. And because I was dreaming about being a singer and literally, you know, as a child, we don't, 
generally, hopefully, if we have good positive reinforcement around us. And my dad was one of those said, dream big, anything to dream of, you know, you can accomplish and you got to work hard, but as long as you don't give up, you'll get it, you know. So I just didn't think about it too much. And I just kept thinking about it, uh, dreaming about it and imagining it. And I literally, uh, they would tell me several times in my childhood that I would literally stand up in bed in the middle of the night and start singing. And I honestly had no memory of it the next day. So I was really deep in hypnosis, a singer in my head. And I can still see, and I, even today, all these decades later, I can see in my imagination the image of what I saw in one of my dreams of me on stage singing. And my hair had the updo of the day, 1950s. And I had my same little girl face because that's the only one that I knew about at that point. But I had lipstick on and makeup and stuff. So it was this very interesting image I have in my head of what I was dreaming. But I dreamt about it so much. And I thought about it and I talked about it to everybody I knew. And I told everybody that I literally conditioned myself to bring in the theme of tonight. I had conditioned myself to just accept it to a point where no one and nothing on the outside world could ever convince me of anything different. It was, it was embedded so early in life. And uh, so that, that influenced me before I ever, uh, and then I had some other life challenges uh, in between teenage years and actually getting into show business at age 20 that I won't go into, but there was some things that happened that got me off on some other worlds. And all of a sudden I found myself at age 20 uh, in a very bad place, a very bad place physically, mentally, and emotionally. Uh, the worst one I'd ever known at that point in, or since, thank, thankfully. And all of a sudden it was almost like I have nothing to lose. <laughs> and I think it was my sister who said, you've been talking about this all your life. Why don't you just go do it? And so I put an ad in the paper and the rest was 20 years of history of the most amazing lifestyle that I could imagine. And 20 years later is uh, right about the time, a year or so before I met Michael, that uh, I had been studying. I started studying because of a back injury I had actually was part of that story uh, at 19. And when I went on the road, I, you know, I, I had a lot of time during the day sometimes. So I, I started studying and finding books on mind body medicine and those kind of things, because I had done something the opposite of what, uh, or very different from what the doctor had told me I needed to do, which involved surgeries and things I was never going to be able to do in my life. And, and again, I had that, that inner voice, wherever that comes from, something came to me as that doctor was talking to me at a very naive age 19, when you didn't question doctors where I came from. And it was so absolute. I walked out of the doctor's office and never looked back and started searching. I ended up curing my back injury. I never had surgery ever then or after. And I did all the things that I wasn't supposed to be able to do, even if I had had the surgeries I wasn't supposed to be able to do. So I ended up dancing and doing everything. So that's the quick, the quick uh, synopsis of, of what showed me there's something else that we have the ability to do with our mind. And there's some intelligence that we have access to as well uh, that comes through us and whatever your beliefs are, or even if you have zero beliefs, it's still there. I have found with my clients <laughs> because they still get that intelligence comes to them in some way. Some of them have an interpretation and others just say, I don't believe in any of that stuff, but I just got something. I don't know where the heck it came from, but I know this is true and it's right for me. So whatever your background is and whatever the interpretations you've been taught or adapted or adopted throughout your life, got you to where you are right now. And right now is a, a part, a very important part of the pivotal response conditioning. Because right now is the only time you can do anything. Right now is the only time you can decide to change and to do something to begin making that change. And the good news is every moment is now. <laughs> So there you go. And some people are busy thinking about what did happen or what might happen or what they wish would happen or what they hope will happen. But I think for our clients, when they come into us, a lot of times I work a lot with medical issues, and I'm sure a lot of you do as well. They're sometimes so absorbed in the story surrounding their condition, their disease, their 
their problem, if it isn't physical, whatever it is, it, every problem I believe affects all mental, physical, emotional, it, it, it's going to be affected regardless what the symptom is showing itself as. And, but they come in and they're living in that, in that hypnotic trance they've been put in by all of the detail and the belief systems and the attitudes and the opinions of the experts maybe that have uh, talked to them, just like that doctor started painting a picture of my future. And sometimes our clients don't have uh, a way to access that intelligence to give them better guidance sometimes or just to let them know, yeah, this is this is a good idea what this doctor's telling me to do. So pivotal response conditioning, uh, when I first became a hypnotist, again, the background of it, I had already learned. I had, I had been doing it. Um, part of the thing of being a performer, because I did mostly live performance, I did do some film and TV and radio and things, but uh, film, yeah. But when you're doing live performances on stage, you have to be in the moment. Because if you're thinking about what's my next line or, you know, what's the next cue, you're going to be, it's just like playing sports. You have to be in the moment. You do the rehearsals, you're thinking in consciousness. But just like when our client is in front of us, we have to be in that moment. If our client's sitting in front of us and we're thinking about what they told us on the phone or the, the last client we had with this similar thing or something like that, or what do I think I need to do with this client before you get there with them? I, I believe you're going to be a lot more limited and you won't be as open to what is the right thing right now in this moment. I have a clock that I kept in. I, I had a facility for about 18 years here and I had to let it go. So I rent space now. But my clock that I had in my training room, instead of 12, 3, 6 and 9, it said now, now, now and now. So it was a running joke and it, the, my students got used to it. And, you know, they'd say, so what time is it? And I'd say it's now. <laughs> Or it's five minutes to now, you know, but it's always now. It was a great reminder. So what you surround yourself with will influence and remind you and condition you to have pivotal, the, the ability to pivot in an instant, which is what this process is about. And again, there's nothing new in the world, I don't believe. I think we learn from all of our great teachers that we meet in our lifetime. And then we repackage, we, we come up with some different a uh, twist on whatever it is that, that really turned us on about it. And that's kind of how this came about. Uh, about two, two years, I guess, into being a hypnotist, I'd already signed up for my the biggest degree program I could find at the time. And I started working on it. And when it came time to start working on a, a dissertation, a thesis, a thesis, I had already seen enough clients and work, work with this and develop this thing that really started out from the idea of anchors and triggers, if any of you are trained in NLP. And NLP didn't invent those either. We all have had anchors and triggers our whole lives. Uh, there was one group that I uh, went to some training with that called them rackets and winning formulas, you know, so there's different names for them. So, but, but we all are, respond to something based on what our exposure was to it and what the emotional react, reaction was to it. That's the way humans develop completely. So what we're doing with our clients, um, when I started seeing them, I realized the things that I'd learned through the hypnosis formal training and the NLP formal training as it was developing and as I was studying more, was more in line with really what I did when I got on stage. I, I realized many things that I was doing that hypnosis and NLP kind of gave me the answers to. And one was when I'd get ready to go on stage, you know, opening night after two weeks of rehearsals and not getting much sleep and, you know, all of that. And, and you got to just all of a sudden you're on stage. Opening night, I would watch the other actors go crazy backstage and being all frustrated. And some of them would even get physically ill. And I thought, wow, that's not a fun way to start your wonderful show that you're supposed to be so happy to do. So I started doing things like if it was a musical, I would do push-ups backstage. It would occupy my mind and my body and get my mind on something else. And I would get involved with that to the point where when it came time to, you know, go on stage, I would have lots of energy and I would be focused and I'd be in the moment. I wouldn't be thinking about my next line or am I going to remember that dance step or whatever it was. So I started, when I started working with clients and doing a hypnosis more formally, I realized how much I had gotten really good at hypnotizing myself. And I started 
developing this technique of pivotal response conditioning because I thought, you know, there's things now like the, this new idea of mindfulness, which really isn't new, of course, but it's kind of a new buzzword the last few years. Uh, and mindfulness is a great first step that I think hypnotists know how to take it to the to the next step. And but, you know, you don't always have time when you're in the middle of a crisis to say, wait a minute, I need to go uh, for 10 minutes. I got to I got to go and, you know, get into a good state so I can deal with what's happening here or deal with this person or whatever it is. So, you know, you don't always have that much luxury, but when we have our clients and with ourselves, hopefully you're working with yourself as well, you know, we do have the luxury of slowing some things down and getting into a state and starting to train into the neurology and the physiology and the imagination and all of it, some kind of a response. Everybody knows about Pavlov's dogs, right? Everybody's read about the, the experiment with the dogs. And it's, that was called conditioned response. And it was, I think it was about 25 years into hypnosis after I'd come up with pivotal response conditioning, thinking it sounded so great for my thesis, right? For my coursework, for my, my dissertation, for my degree. And then about 25 years later, I, I was searching the internet, which I do often for things. And I found out that in the world of psychology, there's something called pivotal response. And I thought, darn, they stole my idea. <laughs> But then I thought, well, you know what? And then I read about it and I said, no, nah, this is this is different. This is pivotal response conditioning. It's about teaching our clients and training into yourself is a nice thing to do as well to be able to pivot in an instant. Because, again, we don't always have the luxury. Wait a minute. I got to get I got to get into a different state to deal with what's happening. As a matter of fact, most of the time, if there's a crisis or if there's somebody that is uh, unusually challenging to deal with, you usually don't have time to go and figure it out or to think clearly. So if you can shift instantly, and I thought, well, you know, I've done this many times in my life, even before I learned hypnosis. And if you all think, I'm, I'm sure you all are already saying, yeah, we all know how to do this. You know, you have a horrible day at work, you know, you've worked all day long, let's say somebody, you know, the worst day in the world and the traffic was terrible coming home and you just want to go home and collapse and you're just in a bad mood and you open the door and the little puppy dog comes running up and starts rolling around on the floor instantly your state shifts, right? So humans know how to do this. We always have from the very beginning and we always will. So why not use it? It's a very, very cool tool to have when something is happening that you didn't expect. And instead of freaking out or, or being less than your best self to have something already trained in, already conditioned that you can instantly shift. And that's what this was about. So I took ideas from NLP, from the, the anchoring and triggering thing, and I started teaching my clients. And it very quickly evolved into this thing where every single client, I'm teaching it on the very first pre-talk, I introduce the idea. And the way I usually do it is they'll be talking sometimes about their horrible dilemma or their terrible uh, disease or their 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 prognosis, their diagnosis they've gotten, those kind of things. And all of a sudden... I'll ask them questions and all of a sudden they'll shift just slightly to say one little thing into a better state. And I'm going to interrupt them right then. I'm going to stop right there and say, you know, as soon as I see them come out of that state they were in, which they've been hypnotized to be in, which is not very empowering. And what we do is we want to look for empowering states, right? So as soon as they shift into something where even just for a second, they're talking about something that they have a little bit of more empowerment or a little better state. I'm going to stop them and say, tell me more about that. You said, you know, you remember when you were, you know, 30 before all this horrible stuff started happening to your body that you, you that you just felt really great in your clothes. Tell me about that. And and if they challenge a little bit, I'll say, close your eyes. I don't say we're doing hypnosis, but you know what? As Michael said, the unconscious is always listening. So I don't want them to drone on too long about what they've been talking to their doctors or their other therapists or whatever about, because that's what they're already hypnotized. They already got that down. That's the recording. That's the, that's the conditioning they already got. I want to start interrupting patterns in that moment, abruptly sometimes, you know, with a, with a quick, I'm doing this for a reason. I'm going to tell you why later. And then I'll get them to shift into that state more and more and more by asking more detail. Tell, go Close your eyes and go back to when you were 30. What was it that made you feel so good about that? What was the best part of it? Building and adding those details that we know to do, those some modalities, getting more detail, of course, puts them into trance. And you don't have to say you're doing hypnosis yet because we want to meet their expectations about the ritual. 
but you can get them into that state. And then even though we haven't discussed it yet, sometimes I'll say, now really imagine you got an imaginary dial in your, in your mind, because you know you do. And if you had an intensity dial in your mind that you could crank that dial up to the highest level of that amazing feeling that you're having, dial it up to the most highest level you can imagine. And you can watch them, of course. And when you see that they're there, I'll say, now just take a, take a breath, breathe, breathe that feeling in and just take your fingers and thumbs on one or both hands, like your index finger and your thumb or your middle finger and your thumb, and just press those together while you take your breath. And now let the breath out, open your eyes and come back here with me. So I'm breaking it right there. And I, I might do that four or five times with different things in the pre-talk. And I started noticing myself doing that. And it really helped me when I started training them how to have this thing that we're going to start teaching the client to be able to pivot in a moment, to interrupt a pattern, to hit pause. In other words, the breath is really great, of course, because it gets uh, oxygen to the brain. And I like using fingers and thumbs, which, uh, of course, everybody's used this. And my very first experience in my very first advanced hypnosis training, which was immediately following my very first basic training in hypnosis with Richard Neves. I'll never forget it. He had me, I volunteered and I got in front of the class and he anchored in about six or seven different things on different knuckles of my hand. And I didn't know what he was doing at the time. And uh, he walked away and he's, I'm sitting behind him in the high chair and He's talking to the students and I'm thinking, should I go sit down? Is he done? What's going on? And all of a sudden he turned around and without saying a word, he put his hand and went like this over my, over my hand, covering my, my knuckles. And to say it in a, in a R rated or, or a G rated way, I'll say it was like the top of my head blew off. It was the most extreme shift in energy in my body that I had ever experienced. That might, might still be true. It got my attention, let's put it that way. And I thought, what in the heck did he just do? And what he had done was just what I was saying. He had had me close my eyes and think of my favorite food and get all the details. And he anchored it on one knuckle. Then he had my favorite smell, anchored it on another one. He, he went through all the different, uh, all the different um, um, senses, right? And it had a different one on each knuckle. And then with that, without me knowing what he was doing, he just put his hand over all of them and fired them all off. And like I said, about blew the top of my head off. So that got my attention. And when I started working with clients, like I said, I remembered that. And I started thinking, how can we use this? If I can shift states that quick, intentionally by something that was put there a few minutes earlier, how can we start teaching this to clients? So that's what I do in the pre-talk. And then I'll start teaching them this idea of, because they don't know what I'm talking about at first anyway. So I'm, I'm just going to say, now what we're going to start doing after I finish, uh, before I start the formal induction, I'll say, now these times that I had you close your eyes and, and take that breath and those fingers, yeah, what's that about? Well, what, what I'm doing and what I'm going to teach you to do now, because we are about empowering our clients because they're the ones that have to make the changes, right? And I'm going to say, well, what I'm going to teach you to start doing is interrupting your own patterns when they're not empowering you, when they're not useful or, you know, good for you, resourceful. So I'll start also uh, accessing resource states. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, circle of excellence, those, those types of processes where you have the client access a, a, a state of happiness or a state of um, confidence, those kind of things, and you anchor them in some way. Now, what I do with my clients is I use this same exact pivotal response, this uh, one breath, one nice intentional breath and pressing a finger and thumb together on both hands. I like that because you can be driving and you can do it. It takes one second and it can either be these fingers or these fingers. I let them decide. Mine is just this way, the Buddha thing, I think it is, right? Is that Buddha? I don't know. Michael probably knows. So what I have them do is practice it a few times in the, in the session. And I'll say, what you're going to start doing is when you leave here before our next session, because I usually do three session packages normal for a lot of things. I'll say, before you come back next week, in between, I want you to start noticing, and you will notice because in the hypnosis that I will reinforce this and talk to their unconscious mind and get it to start getting them to be more aware every time a negative thought or a negative uh, something is, is disempowering them, a pattern. Because if it's, if it's a pattern, it's unconscious. If it's a habit, it's unconscious. So I'm going to get their unconscious mind on board when I do the hypnosis. 
and we're, I'm going to talk to it and say, you know, you're going to really be very, very aware. You're going to you're going to really bring it to her attention when you know, the, any things that she said or he said in the beginning that sent them in a disempowered direction. I'm going to I'm going to uh, talk about bringing that really into their awareness. So they're really hyper like because when I when I bring it up to them, I might say to a client, do you realize since you've been sitting here before we even do the hypnosis, I'll say in the pre-talk, you realize since you've been sitting here, I've heard you say five times. I'll never be able to blank. If that's the pattern I'm hearing, I'm going to, because I want them to be aware. They can't change something if they aren't aware of it. So I'm going to repeat that to them. And they're going to say, and usually the, the response is, yeah, you know, I do say that a lot. And they're aware of it on some level, but it's so automated that they just keep reinforcing it. So what I do is use the pivotal response conditioning to get their unconscious mind to start reminding them and bring it more to their awareness. And just because we talk about it, even in the pre-talk, they will be more aware and they will start to notice, oh, I just said that again. Oh, I just said that thing again, you know. So consciously they're aware of it and unconsciously, because, you know, why not use all of their mind? I learned very early on, I, I learned the old fashioned style of hypnosis when I first trained with uh, Al Krasner, which was lots of fun back 30 years ago now. And, but, but you know, they were, they were still, at least he was, and a lot of people that I studied with early on were still about, you know, get them into hypnosis and that's where you do all the good stuff. But when I first started working with clients, I thought, you know what, they're, I don't know when hypnosis really starts, first of all. And I thought their unconscious mind is always listening. And that in the pre-talk, I realized real early on, that's when a whole lot of the work can be done. And you can set set the uh, tone kind of for the then the deeper work, I call it, to get to some areas where more information might be available. But it's the conscious mind has to be on board, too, because if you work with a smoker, for instance, and, you know, and they have a great experience in your office. This could go with anyone, but smokers are an easy example because it's like either it worked or it didn't. Right. So they come in and they have a great experience and, and everything. And then the minute they walk out the door, their conscious mind jumps in and says, oh, I remember my friend said, you know, it feels really good, but it doesn't really last. If that doesn't really work. And if that jumps in their head and if you haven't covered that in the session, you know, it's going to start polluting all the good work you did most likely. So the, I learned earlier on the conscious mind has to be on board and the, I want the conscious mind to be aware. And a lot of you may be familiar with um, the learning state, the being in that state where you're focused on something, but then you open it up to the peripheral. There's a lot of little processes. I do this in my classes a lot where you just focus on a spot and then open up the frame, so to speak, so that you're out here. And when I first learned that, I, again, had a little mini regression and I said, that's exactly what you do when you're on stage or when you're performing, or if you're giving, if you're a, a good presenter, you're not focused like tunnel vision, you're literally like this, so you can sense where to go. And plus, it gets you out of your consciousness, it gets you out of that thinking mind enough so that you can, so that you can have your creativity available. Doesn't mean it's gone. Like I said, you're never, I don't know if anybody's ever just in conscious or just in, you know, uh, deeper consciousness. It's, there's always that flow that Michael was talking about. And that flow is, is there's useful aspects to all of them. So the conscious mind, I'm going to tell them before they leave the office, I'm going to, I'm going to reinforce some things during the hypnosis in deeper hypnosis uh, at some points when I see that they seem to be in a really good place. And even by the way, just in that relaxed place that, I like to take clients to the first time because most of them haven't ever been that relaxed in a long time, sometimes ever. And when I sense they're in a good place several times during the hypnotic process, I will also say, now take a nice intentional breath and press those fingers and thumbs together. And if they don't physically push the fingers and thumbs together, I'm not going to force it. But I know their mind is hearing this concept. It's about introducing the concept and the philosophy and, and the reasoning behind it. And then little by little, they're going to start picking up on it. So then after the session, their conscious mind, before they walk outside, I'm going to say, now, your conscious mind has very important things to do here. And of course, we explain, hopefully, conscious and unconscious and what, what each does best, you know, and what each can't do, <laughs> which is some things too. And I'll say, your conscious mind's job is to remember to listen to the recording I give you. You know, it's got to remember to hit play, however you're playing it, and then its job's over. 
And I create an unconscious, conscious, uh, imaginary contract with my clients that first session. And I say, you want to give this like a, like a life project six weeks, even if they're only seeing me for two or three or four sessions, I'll say, give it six weeks from today and figure out what that date is. We usually do it in the office. And I'll say, we're going to have an imaginary contract. The conscious mind is going to do what it's good at and support what we're doing in hypnosis and it, with the recordings I give you, which is the unconscious mind's job. The unconscious already knows what's to do because it always wants you to be as happy, healthy, productive, successful as you can be. And that's that's just its natural tendency anyway. So we don't we don't have to worry about it knowing what to do. It's, it's going to figure it out from the unconscious level. But the conscious mind's job for the next six weeks is to support it even if it doesn't know what's going on, even if weird stuff happens in hypnosis, even if you don't know why you're taking that breath or if it's doing anything. So the conscious mind for six weeks agrees to withhold opinion. <laughs> it's not easy to do. But I found this really works with clients because during the hypnosis, you know, they might be and they're saying, I don't know if this is working. And, you know, depending on what you're doing with clients. And, uh, you know, I say, whatever's happening, you're just going to do, do, do for six weeks. It's like a blink of an eye out of your whole life. It'll go by really fast. So just for those six weeks that every time your conscious mind wants to have an opinion about any of this unconscious stuff or about what we're doing or I'm asking you to do, you're just going to say, thank you for wanting to help because we know we don't want to get mad at the conscious mind and try to push it away or try to make it not contribute. And, uh, we know that what you resist, right? You know, the rest of that persists, right? So we don't want them to fight with themselves. We want them to work together. So I'll say that you're just going to be nice to it. Say, thank you for wanting to help me by saying you're not sure if I'm in hypnosis or if I'm going deep enough or whatever it's saying, or if this thing's working. Thank you for wanting to help. But remember, we have a contract and you're going to withhold your, that opinion until this day. And they have the date set. And on that date, you can turn around and look into the past. And look over the past six weeks and you can judge and critique and analyze and have opinions and tell me all about it. And of course, I know that after six weeks, there it's not going to even think about doing that because they're going to already have a bunch of great results and it'll just be all working nicely. But it does seem to help them to kind of get out of their own way of having that little bit of struggle with conscious, you know, conflicting a little bit with the what can be quite bizarre world of the imagination which is why it's so powerful, by the way. It doesn't have limits like the logical, uh, you know, real world, the real world, which is so limited. So uh, that's part of it too. So uh, I give them that. And then I tell them, you're going to use this breath, this intentional breath. And I get them to practice it a few times with me. Like I said, plus I've already incorporated some things into it. I've already introduced some resource states, both in the pre-talk and in the hypnosis part of the um, session. And then afterwards, I'm going to review and explain again what this is all about. And I'm going to say, even if you don't notice anything, don't, don't judge it. You know, remember, the conscious mind is going to withhold all that for six weeks. Just do it, do it, do it. And just look forward to it. Make it like a project. And for the next week while you're, you know, before you come back here, uh, even before you go home, I want you to practice with little things. Don't wait until something big and terrible happens. Practice with those little bitty annoying things like traffic. And I usually tell people, by the time you leave, leave here and get to the stoplight at the next street, you'll probably have two or three opportunities because, you know, people do crazy things in traffic that can be annoying. And, and again, I said, make it the little things that just kind of annoy you. And what you're going to do is when you notice yourself being annoyed at something someone did or something else, you're going to take your breath and press your fingers and thumbs together. And I say, it's, it's like you come back to here, come back to now. That's when I start bringing up the now concept. So you're coming back to uh, what some people uh, resonate with. I call it your control center. And I usually share with them my, my thought, my imagination, because, you know, our, our mind makes up metaphors and imaginary things for everything. And I say, yours might come up with something different, but here's the way my mind thinks of it when I do this. And I demonstrate it for them a few times, too. So we're doing it over and over and over and over and over, repetition. And I'll say, when I do this, it's like I come back to here. It's like, ah, right here. Like now I'm, I'm back in my control center and the Star Wars shield goes up. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I imagine. And I said, you know, it's like if people if they understand that, you know, Star Wars, when the, the spaceship is getting attacked, you know, and the bullets are flying at, at them, they hit the button and the shield goes up. And it's in this case, it only keeps out the things that are negative. Right. And what it actually does 
is allows you to see better, hear better, think better, all of that stuff. You're, you're actually more aware and more alert because the negativity isn't allowed to come through the shield. And if you think in your imagination, the negativity isn't allowed to come through my shield, guess what happens? It tends to stay right there and you're perfectly protected. So the, the, those imaginary things are very popular. And I use, I tell them how it works for me. I said, this might not be the way, you know, comes to you, but in the next week as you're doing this, come up with something that, that just means you're back here, you're back in the now and you're aware and you're in that peripheral. And then I say on the exhale, when you're outside the office, because I want them to really practice this, on the, on the exhale, after you shake off, it's like having that little thing that was annoying, you know, you go like that and flick it off your shoulder, you know, just that quick in one breath. And with the exhale in the next instant, you're going to put your focus on something, anything pleasant, beautiful, happy, pretty. And I say, if you're in Florida, we have really great birds here in Florida and the skies are usually pretty. So I say in that next exhale, find something to focus on that's enjoyable, that's pretty, that's beautiful. You know, a bird uh, or think about your vacation coming up. It can be a person you love, you know, things like that. But find something in your environment if possible. So it's giving them that sense of pivoting off of mild annoyance. Again, we don't want to wait till the crisis happens. And we're starting to condition their unconscious mind and their physical body that they can get into a positive state very quickly. And I'll uh, also tell them, like, you know, in the grocery store, little annoying things. In the grocery store, you know, you're waiting in line, you're running late. And now the person has to go have a price check or they got 12 things in the 10 line, you know, and they're having some kind of thing and you're not really upset or anything, but oh, it's just kind of annoying. Hit pause, hit your pause button. This is pause there. That's their pivot point. And then I said in the grocery store, what I started doing, I started looking at the, the magazine rack because there's really, really funny headlines and you just sit there and just amuse yourself. Show yourself you can put your mind on something, anything else, and amuse yourself. And even if their mind goes back to what was annoying them a few seconds later, they've still hit a bump in those neural pathways. It wasn't a smooth track like it usually was. And I'll talk about this with the clients. I'll say, you know, your mind is starting to learn. Oh, I hit a bump. I hit a bump. And since the unconscious always wants to feel better, it's going to start grabbing that and showing them, hey, yeah, I can shake that off. And then they can get bigger and bigger. So... That's the way I tell them to, to practice the pivotal response conditioning. And the other thing I tell them to do, and this, this applies to tonight, and I'm going to do this as soon as I hang up, as soon as I hang up. Oh my gosh, are we on the phone? <laughs> as soon as I hang up, had a regression there. Uh, Michael, you said telephone or something earlier. It, it made me have a mini regression. I forget what you said. Sent me off. Do you remember what you said? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I don't no. know. That's okay. Anyway, so when I'm done, I'm going to go out on my little patio my lanai and I'm going to look up and see that full moon and I'm and even when I don't plan to do it or think about doing it I notice myself doing it so it's trained in so much that it just shows up without me even meaning to do it sometimes right and I've even had students after I've explained all this to them through the uh, weeks of classes once in a while somebody will say you just did that and I won't even have known that I did it and I think oh well maybe I needed a little more focus or a little more something you know my unconscious knew I needed something and it gave it to me because it's a general resource anchor it's one thing for them to do to get into a resourceful place for whatever the situation is so instead of needing one for confidence one for happiness one for relaxation you know having different things it's trusting the part that I call the the part of them that's the the real expert, you know, about everything that's going on in their life, even beyond what they know consciously, and that expert inside of them that in this instant it it can decide what do I need? Do I need patience? Do I need a little bit of calmness? Do I need more excitement? Whatever it is, and that you can just after you get it trained in, you can just trust that whatever it is I need, I don't have to stop and figure it out or think about it consciously. I can just use it and that's it. And here's how fast it is. It's literally like, okay, okay, what's going on out there? That's it. And then I'm back here with you beautiful people. See, I got something wonderful to focus on here. So it's an instant state shifter because what, what do hypnotists do? We teach our clients how to shift their state. If they don't shift their state, they're going to stay in the same state they're in. And that's not what they want when they come to us, right? They want to be somewhere else 
than where they are. And what they what we're going to help them to understand is where they are is in their imagination, and their imagination is wherever outside influences have put them. And most of the time, if not almost all of the time, it's not a state or a response that they came out of the womb with. And I'll use that language with my clients. I'll say, you didn't come out of the womb with this. You know, this, this was something that came from influences, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's imaginary or real, as we know, as hypnotherapists, the imagined influences are as real and sometimes even more real than what we call the material, real, factual world, right? So uh, that's part of that. Um, I wanted to, sh if, can I share screen, Michael? Is that possible? Yeah, I, it, it might, uh, I might need to give you permission or something, but go ahead and give it a try and see. Okay, because uh, I have a little chart and this was originally inspired by, by a class I took early on, probably there you go. 29, probably 29 years ago. Can you all see that? Uh, this this is a transform a transformed uh, piece of uh, some information that came from Tad James. Some of you may know may have known Tad James, and I took a, a training with him that inspired this. And it's it's not a new idea again. It's the idea, but but what I used it for it it evolved to fit nicely into this pivotal response conditioning. Because it's about we want to empower our clients. That's why they come to us. They want they want to find their power. It's not that we're the one that's powerful. We're showing them how to access the power within themselves, right? So if they can learn to hit pause and pivot instantly from just to be black and white about it, to be, you know, be over exaggerated from victim to victor. And when they walk into our office on some level, they are a victim. They feel helpless in some level. They wouldn't become new ahead in the test usually if, they're, you know, if things are going really well, right? So what we're doing is showing them, yes, you, you do have the power in any instant to shift into a more victorious mindset. Doesn't mean they're going to win or be exactly where they want to be or who they want to be with or whatever in that instant, but it does mean they're going to deal with it in the most healthy and resourceful way. And that's what we're here for to help them do. So the pivot point is now. Again, the good news is every moment is now. And you notice the longer somebody goes down the victim road, the farther away it is to get over to the victor. So what we're starting, usually this is where they are when they come to us. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, they're usually more, you know, they're, they're a long way from being a victor when they come to a hypnotherapist usually. So what we're doing is getting them back to that now moment, regardless of how far or how long they have been victimized by their thoughts and circumstances and people's opinions or whatever. And we can teach them to come back to the moment have a just for a second have a better experience in their mind and body and shift to something pleasant that empowers them. And again, even if it's only for a second or two, it's starting to train it in and it's showing them they have a choice. And those neural pathways do start to get rerouted. They start developing new neural pathways. We know that about the, the brain science now. So, uh, and then these distances get shorter and shorter the more they practice. I tell my clients practice hundreds of times a day. And they kind of look at me funny and I say, I say, well, you know, how many times a day do you breathe? So I say, you know, if you don't have anything annoying, even a little bit annoying that happens today, just do it when you're out there at the stoplight for no reason at all, just to make yourself feel even better than you maybe already feel okay, but see what you can do to take that breath, come back to now just to practice it. And then find a bird or find this, a cloud or find something prettier to look at. And then I have, uh, oh, I started to say earlier about the full moon. I don't think I finished that thought. So I'll, I'll close that loop. <laughs> I did that on purpose, Michael. Uh, so the other thing I have them do is I say, um, I also, besides using it just for no reason at all or for little annoying things, I want you to also use it for what I call awe of nature moments. Because because what are all of nature moments? They're empowering, aren't they? When I walk out and look at that moon, I feel empowered. In that moment, I feel it's it's a just a, all of nature moments, right? Uh, rainbows, beautiful skies, um, beautiful sunset, maybe a full moon, those kinds of things. I say, 
And what you're going to do when you see something unexpectedly, and uh, when I moved into my last uh, office, started working out of this most recent office, one night I was there till uh, late in the afternoon and it had been raining. And when I walked out, I turned the corner and there was a double rainbow just right over straight in front of me where I was where I was going to be driving. And I was I was using my breath like <laughs> I don't know how many times I did it while I was driving, but I did it a bunch. But I tell them, you know, if you see something unexpectedly that's beautiful in nature, just if you if you can hit pause, hit your pause just for that second and just breathe it in and come back to your center here and go into your peripheral and really soak it in. And then I say before you go to sleep at night, you know, if you were in a hurry and you remember you, you did it real quick and there was a full moon or there was a rainbow or something else beautiful, but you couldn't stop and really, really enjoy it before you go to sleep at night. Guess what? Your mind took a picture of it because you stopped and became aware of it and used your breath. So as you're drifting off to sleep, close your eyes and bring that snapshot back of that beautiful sunset and let yourself linger on it. You know, just, just, is that a word? Linger? I don't know. You know what I mean? Just be there with it and let yourself drift off to sleep, enjoying giving yourself the time to enjoy what you were in a hurry and couldn't stop and enjoy early. So those are some of the other ways I saw. And by the time they come back the first week, some people have really had some interesting experiences. Others go, well, I did it a lot, but I don't know what, what it was doing. And I say, that's okay. Remember we said that your conscious mind doesn't need to understand what we're doing at the unconscious level. It, it knows what we're doing at far and, and it'll start showing you some things and they get some explore. So um, the pivot point again is now. Now is a life event every moment. It's an energy choice point, as it says up top. It's your choice. So they're also being empowered to know I actually can shift my state. I can hit pause on whatever I'm feeling and I can make myself feel better instantly. And it, again, it gets the more they practice, of course, as we know, the better it gets. So pivot point for pivotal response conditioning, the longer you go down the victim pathway, like I said earlier, the farther away the victor path gets. Every moment offers the opportunity to pivot from victim to victor because every moment is now. The more often they pivot away from being the victim mindset, the faster and shorter the journey to the victor path gets. And pretty soon they can do it instantly. And like I said, after it's trained in, because it is conditioning, we know our mind knows how to do this. After a while, those little annoying things don't even, they don't even annoy them at all anymore because the mind already, already shifts it before they even have, have a thought. So they have a new response trained in, and it's very powerful. So talking about uh, on the victim side, which again, in, in some level, they're with they're coming to us because they feel uh, like like they're a victim. They may not use that word, but that's in our in our like I said to keep it very simple. In simplest terms, they are victim to whatever their problem is that they can't seem to figure out how to make it better on their own. That's why they're coming to see us. So they are the effect of either a person or a situation or a disease or whatever. Uh, it's, you know, something or someone else is causing me. They're at cause. I'm the effect of it. And that means that thing or that person is to blame for my situation. You know, that disease is to blame. That person that, that ran into my car and gave me a, a bad back, whatever it is. Uh, and our job is to get them to start being at cause, not that they caused their problem, but they are at cause for how they deal with it, for being empowered to, in the moment, be as resourceful as possible to make choices to allow their situation to be as good as it can be now and come up with creative ideas how to maybe make their situation better in ways that they can't see if they're on the victim side. So over here, there's blame on the victim side. We're getting them over to being responsible for making choices. That's all that means. It's nobody's to blame, uh, including themselves, because a lot of times people come in blaming themselves. No, it's like you are in control. You're powerful. You're getting results now instead of having reasons, which is why uh, many times I'll say the why question I find in the hypnotic process, especially the pre-talk, the why question very rarely gets useful information. There's exceptions to everything, but it rarely gets useful informa it, 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 information because if you ask somebody why, you're going to get all those reasons and they're going to tell them to you anyway. 
and I won't let a client go on too long because their their patterns are going to start repeating and they're already living in that world. I want to get them out of that world as fast as possible and get them to start experiencing even in the pre-talk as, as soon as I can, that they can actually make themselves feel better just by thinking about something different for a second, that they can shift their state. That's what we are. We're state shifters. We create the situation and teach them how to shift their own states. And uh, so, oh, by the way, the, the victim side gets a lot of support, which is why people get stuck there. At the bottom, you see, that's the stuck side. You know, they get weaker, they're constrained, they're un they get unmotivated, sometimes apathetic. Uh, they're limited, they have no options, they feel sad and depressed, they're stuck. But it can be very comfortable and you have lots of, lots of um, support groups on that side. And I don't want you to make me think that I think all support groups are less than useful, <laughs> but I'm still looking. <laughs> but the ones that I have spoken at and listened to the way they're run, I see them supporting people staying the victim and having more and more reasons yeah. why they deserve to feel as miserable as they are. So I'm sorry. I'm sure there's good ones out there. So, but our job isn't about any of that. Our job is to get them to be at cause, to be powerful, to be empowered, to have some tools to take out of our office so they don't just feel good when they're in our office. And then when they come back, they can say, yeah, I did this. Tell me what you did. Tell me what you did. And now they're moving and growing. They're, they're changing. They're thinking differently. And when you think differently, of course, you act differently, you feel different. So that's that. I can stop that now. And again, that grew out of uh, inspired by some Ted James classes that I took. Uh, and then it evolved through the years like we all do, hopefully. And I don't know, I don't have much time left, but I'd love to take some questions. I went kind of fast because I thought I had an hour and a half. So I don't know why I thought I had an hour and a half, but I said, oh, good, I can talk fast. I'm used to that. <laughs> Great job, Patty. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Don Pellis has a question. Don, you want to unmute? And Don, yeah. I saw you earlier. Where'd he go? I'm here. Why can't I see him? I don't know. Oh, there you are. No, I see you. So, so tell me again. You, you, you pause. You have them pause. And, and you, you, anchor, you anchor the whole thing, right? The whole so they pause and then they think about something nice right that's basically the, the first yeah it's it's done very quickly to explain it you know it takes longer obviously but the hitting pause is the breath and the fingers and thumbs okay the reason i like fingers and thumbs by the way and i will say this to the client because it might inspire their unconscious creative mind a little bit to have a little more understanding about it. I say because when you do this it's like now I'm pushing my own buttons okay so you take a deep breath so the breath and the fingers go along with the Star Wars like like it's like a work field that just all of a sudden now they're back to now and like that then what then then they just let go and on the exhale that's when they focus on so anything that makes them happier feel better okay Okay. Yeah. So it's literally, it's so fast, but it takes a while to explain, like I said. So it literally is like this. Oh, gosh, darn it. I should have done. Oh, yeah. Look at that moon you know, or whatever. Okay. Just to shift. It's, it's, a, it's a pivot. It's an instant. And again, in real life, we usually, it takes us longer to get from a negative state to a positive state. So I want them to start working with little things just to, I say, make a game out of it. Make it fun. <laughs> you know, if, it can, if it can be fun, they're more likely to do it. So make it just a project and have fun with it. And don't think too much about, you know, anything else about how it's working or if it's working or any of that. And I say, just do it a lot and, and, and think about coming back to here, you know, into your power, your comfort, your, your uh, power center, I call it. And, and now, now you're in the now. So they're not thinking about that person that just cut them off. In other words, they're back in their car and they can focus on something else just for a few seconds. And again, if they go back to it, they can either do it again or at the very least, they won't be as probably annoyed. And they, they know that they can get off of it just for a few seconds and then you build on that and then the next session i'll 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 get some more resource states i'll have them put that in there i'll have them keep adding more resource states to that same 
uh, process, just so that their mind knows whatever I need right now, my mind will bring it and trusting that the unconscious mind knows what I need. I don't have to, I don't have to hit pause and take 10 minutes to figure it out. I'm going to trust myself. So it's very, I think it's very empowering and I have used it at times, by the way, it doesn't just work in that instant that you take the breath because when my dad got sick, I spent six weeks. This was an unexpected thing. Uh, I ended up spending six weeks with him at the end of his life in a trailer with him and my sister. And he was in a hospital bed and I did things that I'd never done before uh, that, that I had to learn how to do from hospice because he was with, you know, put under hospice care, but there weren't nurses there. It was me. And my sister, who has had three children, but she still couldn't handle it. So I was the one taking care of it. She was my challenge. And, and without me thinking about it during those six weeks, when I got back, I think it was finally when I got back home after he passed away, that I started looking back at the six weeks. And every memory I had of the whole six weeks was positive. And I was thinking about watching baseball with him. And we were singing together and just, and, and all of the other stuff that I had to do on a daily basis was just kind of like way back in the background. It wasn't even part of my memory. So my unconscious, because I'd been using these processes, I think it lasted six weeks to get me through that in a way. And with my sister, I did it intentionally a few times when she started to get on my nerves. You know, I would take my breath and I'd go, okay, you know, she's who she is and ain't gonna change. And being in a trailer for six weeks with her was very challenging, you know. But, but it, I realized it's there. Once it's there and you trust it, your mind will bring it for as long as you need it. But training it in with the clients, it's that it's getting. See, here's the thing. People that are happy, that seem to be happy all the time. If anybody knows someone who's happy all the time, you know, they probably didn't go to a hypnotist and learn how to be happy all the time. Right. It became something that they somehow in consciousness trained into their ability to realize it's life is a lot more pleasant when I'm in a good mood. And they just maybe decided one day, I'm just not going to let that other stuff bother me and or whatever it was. And they they became that. Right. So it's not like we're teaching a technique that's doing anything to the person. We're giving them something to remember at an unconscious level that they have the ability to feel better, that they have the power. It's not about the technique. It's about them having an experience in them that aha of, oh, my gosh, I don't have to feel that way. I don't have to feel helpless. And it's, it's just, it's so empowering to know we can change our life circumstances forever. Just and the hard part to uh, be convinced of is that conscious logical mind that says, oh, but it can't be that easy. But we know that in hypnosis, it can. And I have done things in hypnosis that people said was impossible. And I'm sure all of you have. So there you go. Oh, there you go. Oh my gosh, Patty. Uh, the time has just flown by. Yes, it is. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. This is such a beautiful group. Thank you so much. Well, they're gonna I was getting a lot of good energy from everybody. I love it. We're going to get a chance to give you a sound bath in a second on the way out the door. So, uh, uh, Should I take my clothes off? Well, oh, yeah, yeah. That help. <laughs> I haven't done that in a long time. Oh, it, it, it will make the video. It's not on the recording. Is it? Be able to sell more copies of the video. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, but but really, thank you so much. We we, we appreciate it. Uh, you've done a you've done a great job and uh, you've given us some good stuff to to ponder over. And uh, and hey, that's what we're here for. So everybody, uh, come back next month for uh, our July surprise. Don't forget in the meantime that uh, on July 9th and tenth, board certified hypnotist program. If you haven't yet realized how much you want to get that. Uh, you can begin to think about that over the course of the night, like while you're napping, sleeping, resting, or or even if you just put your thumb and fingers together. And then uh, and then tomorrow you can call the uh, IAC 9 BHA office and register for that course. Uh, Hypno Thoughts, July 29th through the 31st, at Galaxy of the Stars, September 10th and 11th, and God knows what else. So we'll look forward to seeing you around the community. We'll see you a month from now at the virtual chapter, second Tuesday of next month, whatever date that is. And by the way, Patty, I do want to point out that the moon is always full. It just doesn't always look that <laughs> <laughs> with that we should probably just say good night <laughs> i think we should so everybody open up your microphones and uh, send patty off with a lot of love and good night, patty. Be in here. Good night.
Nate. Thank, thank you. you. Thank nice you. you. Happy Patty. Great talk. Thank Good you. Night. Take care, folks. Bye. 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 Have a good night, everybody. Thanks.